بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما إن شاء الله today we will continue with our study of the seerah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Last week, we spoke about the early days after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ to al Madina, and some of the things that he did in that early period in al Madina. From those things that the Prophet ﷺ did during the early time after the hijrah in al Madina, is that he built Masjid Quba, and then after that he built Masjid al-Nabawi, and he did the mu'akha between the muhajireen and the ansar meaning he took someone from the muhajireen and he took someone from the ansar and he made them brothers to each other so he would take one person from the people of mecca and one person from the people of medina and he would say now you two are brothers so this is how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established the love and the unity in the hearts of the muslims between the people of Mecca and the people of al Madina, So these were some of the early steps that the Prophet ﷺ took when he first migrated to al Madina. Also, the Prophet ﷺ, he made some treaties and some agreements with the leaders of the Aus and the Khazraj and also the leaders of the Jews. Now remember, the Prophet ﷺ is the head of state of Medina now. So he is actually the chief executive of al Madina. So nobody can say no to his orders. He's the boss. So when he decided to make these treaties with the heads of the different tribes in Medina, the Aus and the Khazraj, and also the Jews, they could not say no to him. The Aus and the Khazraj, pretty much most of them had become Muslims. But as for the Jews, most of them stayed upon disbelief. There were a few Jews here and there who had also accepted Islam. But for the most part, the Jews, they remained upon their disbelief. While the majority of the Aus and the Khazraj had accepted Islam. So anyhow, the Prophet ﷺ, as the head of state, he made some agreements and some treaties with the leaders of these different factions with the leaders of Aus, the leaders of Khazraj and the leaders of the Jews and even if they agreed or disagreed they could not do anything about it because the Prophet ﷺ was the one who had the power. So from the conditions of these treaties that the Prophet ﷺ made with these leaders was that no one from amongst them could make their own treaties without getting it approved by the Prophet ﷺ. So they couldn't make these type of treaties and agreements amongst themselves except if it went through the Prophet ﷺ. And anyone who would make these individual treaties, they would hold no value. So the Prophet ﷺ himself, he had the final say. So they couldn't make any type of treaty without ratification by the Prophet ﷺ. So this was one of the conditions of the treaties that the Prophet ﷺ made with these people. Also, a very important condition that he made in these treaties was that no one from al Madina was allowed to take any refugees from the Quraysh. If anyone runs away from the Quraysh, for some reason, for whatever reason, and they try to come to Medina, and they try to take refuge in Medina, they will be rejected. So Medina cannot be a place of refuge for anyone from the Quraysh. And this is a very, very important point. And it really showed a very strong political position as well. That this was basically showing that there will be no political ties between Medina and the Quraysh. And that's a very powerful statement to the Quraysh that we're not going to deal with you politically at all. So the Prophet ﷺ, he placed these political sanctions on the Quraysh and 
from the conditions of the treaties that he made with the leaders of the different tribes in Medina was that no one was allowed to accept any type of refugee from the Quraysh and no one was allowed to have any type of political dealings with anyone from the Quraysh. So basically, they were cut off politically. And also, there was a joint agreement that the Prophet ﷺ imposed in these treaties that everyone in Medina has to cooperate against any type of attack on Medina. If anyone was to attack Medina, then everyone should cooperate together to make sure that Medina is kept safe. So these were some of the conditions of the treaties that the Prophet ﷺ made with the different tribes in al Medina. So no one could make their own treaties without getting it approved by the Prophet ﷺ. He had the final say. No acceptance of any refugees from the Quraysh. No political cooperation with the Quraysh. And everyone has to work together to make sure that Medina is kept safe from its enemies. And everyone had to agree to these treaties that the Prophet ﷺ had set forth. Later on, the Jews, they betrayed the treaty. And we'll speak about that inshallah in a later lesson. But later on, the Jews of Medina, they betrayed this trust and this treaty that they had agreed to with the Prophet ﷺ. So this was one of the early things that the Prophet ﷺ made sure he took care of when he arrived in Al-Madina. So that there would be no type of chaos in terms of the government. The Prophet ﷺ was the head of state and he made sure that everyone knew that and he made sure that they knew that they couldn't do anything without his approval. So this was one of the first steps that the Prophet ﷺ took to make sure that there was stability. That the people knew who the ruler was, they knew who the head of state was, and they knew that they had to obey him, whatever he told them to do. So there was political stability in al Medina. This was during the early period after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. Also, during the early period of the Prophet ﷺ's arrival in al Madina, one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the great men of the, the Ansar, a man by the name of <coughs> As'ad ibn Zurara, عن, he passed away. Shortly after the Prophet ﷺ arrived in al Madina, As'ad ibn Zurara, عن, he passed away. And what is significant about this man, As'ad ibn Zurara, he was the man who used to lead the Muslims in Salatul Jumu'ah. He was the khatib of the Muslims and he used to lead them in Salatul Jumu'ah before the Prophet ﷺ arrived in al Madina. Remember that the people of Medina, the Ansar, they had accepted Islam and the hijrah of the Muslims from Mecca to Medina was going on and the Prophet ﷺ actually went to Medina very late after most of the Muslims had already reached al Madina, So during that time, of course, Salatul Jumu'ah was there. People were praying their prayers, right? So who was leading them in Salatul Jumu'ah? It was this man, As'ad ibn Zurara radiallahu anhu. So he has a special significance in Al-Islam as well as being the khatib of the Muslims in the Medina before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself arrived from Mecca to al Madina. So he passed away shortly after the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ in al Madina. Also during the early period in al Madina was the Prophet ﷺ, his marriage to Aisha radiallahu anha. Actually, they had done the nikah before the hijrah, but Aisha radiallahu anha came to live with the Prophet ﷺ as his wife after the hijrah to al Madina. And she was very beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One time, a man came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked him, Ya Rasulullah, Man ahabbu nasi ilayk? O Messenger of Allah, who is the most beloved of the people to you? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he replied, Aisha. He said, Aisha is the most beloved of people to me. And then the man asked, Minar rijal, 
okay, from the men, who is the most beloved of the people to you? And then he replied, Abuha, her father. So Aisha radiallahu anha was the most beloved of people to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from the men, her father Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the most beloved of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this was the station of Aisha radiallahu anha. And you know, so many ahadith and so much ilm came down from Aisha radiallahu anha. There are so many narrations that were narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. And there is so much ilm, so much knowledge that was passed down from her radiallahu anha. Despite her young age, she was very young, but still she was a mountain of knowledge. She was a mountain of ilm. And we have benefited greatly from her radiallahu anha wa ardaha. And no one badmouths Aisha radiallahu anha. No one curses Aisha radiallahu anha except an open kafir or a munafiq. Anyone who says anything bad about Ummul Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha, that no, then know that this person is a disbeliever or this person is a munafiq. For sure. Because Aisha radiallahu anha is beloved to Allah and beloved to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So her enemies are our enemies. And there is no question about that. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless those who love Aisha radiallahu anha and the other Ummahat al Mu'mineen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deal with the people who speak badly about him, about her. To deal with them in a way that they deserve to be dealt with. So this happened during the early stage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's arrival in al Madina that Aisha radiallahu anha came to live with him as the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also during the early period in al Madina was the birth of one of the great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn al-Zubair. Abdullah ibn al-Zubair radiallahu anhu. A great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with great parents. Both his father and his mother were from the great sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn al-Zubair radiallahu anhu. He was the son of al-Zubair ibn al-Awam and Asma bint Abi Bakr. So look at the parents of Abdullah ibn Zubair. Zubair ibn al-Awam and Asma bint Abi Bakr. Who is Zubair ibn al-Awam? Zubair, he was a cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The mother of Zubair, the mother of Zubair was Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. The mother of Zubair was Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. And the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. So the mother of Az-Zubair and the father of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were sister and brother. So they were cousins. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Az-Zubair, they were cousins. So Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair radiallahu an, he was born during the early days of the Hijrah to al Madina, So the mother of Abdullah, Asma bint Abi Bakr, she actually made Hijrah <coughs> from Mecca to al Madina while she was pregnant. And she gave birth to Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair after she arrived in al Madina. Now, what makes this significant is that during the first four months of the Hijrah to Medina, after the Muslims came from Mecca to Medina, during the first four months in Medina, all of the children who were being born to the Muslims, any child who was born to the Muslims during the first four months in Medina, they were all dying. They would be born and shortly after, they would pass away. This went on for four months. Whether it was a child of the Muhajireen or it was a child of the Ansar, all of the children of the Muslims who were being born in Medina, for the first four months after the Hijrah, they would, they would die after they were born. So the Jews, they were actually very happy about this because they were the enemies of the Muslims and they had hatred for the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. So they were very happy about this. And they said that this is happening because of magic that we have done upon them. 
We have done magic upon them. So look what's happening. Their children are all dying. But when Abdullah ibn Zubair, radiallahu anhu, when he was born, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took a date and he chewed off a piece of that date. And then he put that date inside the cheek of Abdullah ibn Zubair and he rubbed it. And this is called a tahnik. So the first thing that entered the mouth of Abdullah ibn Zubair, this young baby, was the saliva of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So that's something that's very blessed. So Abdullah ibn Zubair, he lived. He didn't die. He lived past that four months and he lived longer than that. And the Muslims were very happy because this disproved the allegation of the Jews that the fact that the Muslim children were dying was because of a magic that they had done upon them. So this, this disproved that allegation. So the Muslims were very happy. So they celebrated this baby, Abdullah ibn Zubair. And they took him, they held him, and they walked around the streets of Medina in front of the houses of the Jews saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Akhzallahu al-Yahud. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Akhzallahu al-Yahud. So they would say this as they were taking Abdullah ibn Zubair, this baby, around in front of the houses of the Jews and they would say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has humiliated the Jews. They made this allegation and now they have been proven wrong and humiliated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it was a very, very momentous occasion for the Muslims, the birth of this baby and the survival of this baby. Later on, as many of you probably know, Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu an, he was murdered by Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, he said, I saw the people who made takbir when Abdullah ibn Zubair was born. And I saw the people, the people of Hajjaj, the supporters of Al-Hajjaj. I saw them also make takbir when Abdullah ibn Zubair was killed. Can you believe these people? The, the cronies of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, when they murdered Abdullah ibn Zubair, they said Allahu Akbar as if they did something good. Wal-iyadu billah. So Abdullah ibn Umar, he witnessed both of these days. He said, I saw the people making takbir when Abdullah ibn Zubair was born. And I saw the people making takbir. I saw the people of Hajjaj making takbir when Abdullah ibn Zubair was killed. And then he said, Wallahi, lalladheena kabbaru inda mawlidi Abdullah khayrun min alladheena kabbaru inda maqtalihi. He said, Wallahi, the people who made takbir when Abdullah was born are better than the people who made takbir when Abdullah was killed. So this was Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu an. Also, from the events that happened during the early days in al Madina was the legislation of the Adhan. The legislation of the Adhan. As we know and as we have spoken about before, Salah was made obligatory upon the Muslims before the Hijrah on the night of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, on the night where the Prophet ﷺ was taken from Al-Masjid Al-Haram to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and then taken up to the heavens. On this night, Salah or prayer was made obligatory upon the Muslims and that was before the Hijrah. So the Salah continued, of course, after the Hijrah of the Muslims to al Madina, And there were five prayers in a day. But the people didn't really have an organized method of gathering together at the time of the prayer. So they would basically look at the sun <coughs> and they would make an estimation regarding the time of Salah and they would come to the masjid. So some of them would come early, some of them would come maybe right on time, some of them would come late. But there was no organized method of getting everyone together at the time of the jama'ah. So that was an issue. So it was discussed amongst the companions and with the Prophet ﷺ, what should we do to gather the people together so that everyone comes at the same time and we can pray in the jama'ah. So they discussed different options and they came to the conclusion that they would use a bell. <coughs> they came to the conclusion that they would use a bell, that they would ring and the people would hear it and they would come to the masjid to pray in the jama'ah. So they made that agreement that they were going to do that. But before they could actually implement it, 
a companion of the Prophet ﷺ by the name of Abdullah ibn Zayd that night. He had a dream. He had a dream. He saw a man. <coughs> he saw a man with a bell. And Abdullah went to this man and he said, "Can I, can I have this bell?" And the man said, "Why? What do you need it for?" He said, "To call the people for the prayer. To call the people for a salah." And then the man said, "Shall I not teach you something that is better than that?" I can teach you a way to gather the people for salah that is better than using this bell. Do you want me to teach it to you? And Abdullah said, yes, teach it to me. So the man said, say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah, ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah, hayya ala al-falah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. Say this, and that will gather the people to come for a salah. So when he woke up from this dream, he went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw this dream, and this man taught me this, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was happy to hear this, and he said, Inna hu la ru'ya haq, insha Allah. Insha Allah, this is a true dream. And then he said, go and teach these words to Bilal and let him do it. Go to Bilal and teach him these words and let him do it. فَإِنَّهُ أَنْدَى صَوْتًا منك. Because his voice is better than yours. His voice is clearer than yours and his voice is more of an effective voice in calling the people. So Abdullah ibn Zaid, he went to Bilal, he taught him these words. And Bilal radiallahu anhu, when it was time for salah, he climbed on the roof of the masjid. At that time, there were no minarets. It was just a simple building. So Bilal would call the adhan from the top, the roof of the masjid. So he climbed the masjid. He went out to the roof and he started calling the adhan. And when he started calling the adhan, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he heard it. And when he heard it, he quickly came out of his house and he quickly approached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, I had a dream. I had a dream where I heard these same words that Bilal is saying right now. So the Prophet ﷺ was very happy that Abdullah ibn Zayd and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhumah, both of them, they had the same dream. And both of them had this true dream regarding the adhan. So that happened during the early days of the hijrah to al Madinah. Also, from the events that took place during the early days in Al-Madina was the completion of Salah. And what does that mean? The completion of Salah. We said that Salah was made wajib upon the Muslims on the night of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj while the Prophet ﷺ was still in Mecca before the Hijrah. But the Salah, it was five times a day, but every prayer was two rak'at. Fajr was two, Dhuhr was two, Asr was two, Maghrib was two, Isha was two. All of the prayers were two, 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 two. So during the early period of the Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated the completion of the raka'at of the prayers. Fajr stayed the same as two raka'at, but Dhuhr was extended from two to four. Asr was extended from two to four. Maghrib was extended from two to three. And Isha was extended from two to four. So this legislation occurred during the early period of Al-Madinah as well. But during travel, during travel, it stays on the asl. It stays on what originally was prescribed. Except for Maghrib. Maghrib stays three. During, during residence and during travel. Whether you're traveling or not, Maghrib will always be three. But as for the four raka'at prayers, during travel, they are shortened down to two. Which was the original state of that salah anyways. So when you're traveling, Fajr 